Тинг. Лайк тисла. Geek Thoughts, Micah here. This is Think Like Tesla. This is a program where we celebrate a certain Serbian inventor and all-around awesome guy, Nikola Tesla, and we help you become a better thinker. So Tesla once said, the scientists of today think deeply instead of clearly. And we're going to take on a topic today that is going all around the internet in certain uh, circles, and we're going to help you guys think clearly about it. Now, it all starts with Professor Walter Lewin. Now, I never had a teacher this good in, in all my education in my college. He's a retired MIT professor. He teaches physics, and in particular, a lot of electronic and magnetic physics. All of his lectures are online. You can go read them. I'll include links. Or you can watch them. I'll include links below. But he has a, shall we say, infamous video called Kirchhoff is for the Birds. Now, we'll talk about what Kirchhoff means. We actually covered it in an earlier video. Um, if you remember, we talked about the water pipe analogy, and we also talked about the right-hand rule. How a changing magnetic field can induce a current flow. Those two things are going to collide head-on in just a second here. In particular, the great electroboom questioned whether Kirchhoff's law always holds or not. Lewin states quite adamantly that it's for the birds. It does not always hold. It's a special case of a bigger rule. Electroboom said it always holds, and he cited some experimental evidence. So this goes back and forth. If you take Lewin's conclusion to its natural limits, it, you arrive at a very non-intuitive explanation that I'm going to show you here in just a second. Okay, so all the links are below. With that, here we go. Now you see in the circuit here, we have a battery that has one volt, a resistor for 100 ohms, and a resistor for 900 ohms. This causes a current in the conventional direction to circulate through this loop here. We can calculate the voltage drop across this resistor, which is 0.1 volts, this resistor 900 ohms, 9 tenths of the resistance, so it's got 0.9 volts. And this meter, these two meters here, V1 and V2, you'd expect them to read the same amount. If we go this way, from top to bottom, through this resistor, we can see it's dropping 9 tenths of a volt, and that's what this meter shows. If we go the other way from top to bottom, we see we get a 1 volt, and we subtract from that because this is positive in this direction, this is positive in this direction. We subtract from 1 volt the tenth of a volt that's dropped across this resistor, and we also get 9 tenths of a volt. So these two meters that are hooked up to the same point of the circuit give you the same reading as you would expect, right? The uh, conservation of energy tells us that this has to be the answer. If this were not the case, that if you went all the way around the circle and you come back to your starting point and you get, after adding up and subtracting everything, you get to the zero. That's what Kirchhoff's law is. So you go around a loop, and it can be any loop anywhere in the circuit. You end up with zero volts. If that were not the case, that would mean either you're getting voltage for free out of something, free energy, we know that's not a thing, or you're just mysteriously having energy vanish from your system. Fortunately, that's not a thing either. So, Kirchhoff's voltage law. I'm going to pause here for just a second to make sure you guys are really clear on this. Sometimes I get excited about explaining something and I go too fast. If I do that, please say so in the comments. I just want to make sure you got this part down cold because it's going to be very important in what comes up next. So we're looking at the simulator here. we got a few circuits. This top circuit here has a 1 milliamp DC constant current source and a dead short across it. That's totally fine. So because these are idealized wires, no resistance at all, you can basically think of them as superconductors. So we have no voltage potential showing up here, even though there's a current flowing, and that's fine. So this is kind of an extreme case, but Kirchhoff voltage law applies here, because when you go all the way around, you're still at zero volts. Okay, the second one here is kind of interesting. We have a one volt source pushing current up and a one volt source pushing current down. And each of those have an equal resistor on it. So voltage goes up one volt, goes down one volt, up one volt, down one volt. So at this point and this point here, again, we have zero volts. So, and if you go on the full loop, zero volts plus zero volts is still zero volts. Um, one more, this is the one we just showed off on the post-it note. We can see the voltmeters are reading the same volt value. So from this point on the bottom here up to the top, 
you have a plus one volt and we have a voltage drop of a tenth on this resistor so that makes so how you get the 900 millivolts here and then um, from here you have 900 millivolt drop and the current is going up in this branch and down in this branch so when you go around the whole loop it adds up to zero if you start off at an elevation of say 10 feet which is about where I'm at right here and you walk on any loop anywhere you go anywhere on the earth climb up down whatever by the time you get back to the same point your elevation if you sum up all the little inclines and declines that you crossed if you sum all those up it'll have to add up to zero so your starting elevation and your ending elevation were the same hope that's a useful analogy all right back to the experiments now the question is does this always apply and in all the kinds of analysis you're likely to come across in repairs, in maker stuff, building, it probably always holds. But there is a special case in which it doesn't. So let me... For some reason, the first page of this printed landscape. But let's look at this one here. Okay, this is the official diagram from the paper. I'll put a link to this paper, too. This is from a 1982 paper by Robert H. Romer. And this is just, I redrew the circuit here so I could write on it without uh, disrupting my paper here. Okay, super quick refresher. If you saw one of my earlier videos, you saw this view here, where an electromagnet produced a static electric field, right? Putting a DC current through here made a field that the, attracted the compass. But what we're talking about in this next section is a changing magnetic field. So here's the Wikipedia page on electromagnetic induction. So in this little circuit up here, you can see there's a DC battery source with a switch. So it's, it's connected for just a pulse that creates a changing magnetic field. And the secondary, this is a second winding here, will show a brief voltage spike depending on, on the, when the current is changing. So in what we're about to see, there's a solenoid uh, designated as a circle. Think of that as this winding here. And there's just one loop of wire in the circuit. And think of that as this winding here as we go forward. All right, let's see how this works. The difference between this and the previous circuit is that one volt battery is gone. And instead, we have a solenoid coming out through the page. And as we discussed, a changing magnetic field through that solenoid or produced by that solenoid, causes a current to circulate in these wires here. And that has to change over time for it to happen. So we're going to snapshot this at the instant in time when one volt is produced in this loop. So just like the other circuit had one, had a one volt battery, this one has one volt induced through the magnetic flux. And, spoiler alert, we're going to discover that these two voltmeters, which are connected to the exact same two points in the circuit, A and B, are going to give us different readings. And in just a minute, you're gonna understand why and be able to explain it. Okay, so let's analyze the circuit. So we know that there's one volt circulating through this inner loop here around the solenoid. And since there's a thousand ohms, one divided by a thousand is one, one thousandth, one milliamp, is circulating in here. By definition, Kirchhoff's law doesn't hold here, right? So if we start here and we go around this loop, we've we're one volt off because one volt is being induced from this magnetic field, right? So the, the loops over here to the sides do not go around the solenoid magnetic field. So Kirchhoff's law must hold for these. So this is a Kirchhoff loop. This is a Kirchhoff loop. The middle one here is not. It has a one volt difference. So same as before, we can calculate there's one tenth of a volt across this resistor and nine tenths across this one. And since Kirchhoff's law must apply, we must get to a zero. That means this meter here must read negative one-tenth of a volt. This has nine-tenths of a volt going this direction in the current. So by Kirchhoff's law, this loop here must sum to zero. So this one would show 0.9 volts. So these two meters connected to the same points in the same circuit not only show different values, they also show show different polarities. All right, so this, by the way, is called a line integral when you go all the way around a loop, or even part, part of the way around a loop. So congratulations, you just learned some uh, 
vector calculus just for fun. One more jump in here for a clarification and an explanation. So by means of a clarification, I wanted to explain the conservation of energy, since we brought that up earlier. So as you probably know, the conservation of energy only holds in a closed system. In the circuit that we're looking at here, it's no longer a closed system because it's getting an influence from an external magnetic field. Now the other clarification is that from an engineering standpoint, sometimes you can make little tweaks to this to make something that kind of seems like Kirchhoff's law works. So in this fourth circuit down here, notice we have inserted a one volt battery at a particular place. There's no physics reason why we should insert the source at that particular point other than it makes the numbers come out right. So if you're a clever engineer, you can often do things that make it seem like Kirchhoff's law is holding in this case. We're getting the same measurements as before. Everything seems like it works out right because we're getting the right answer. And if you're an engineer, what else <laughs> matters besides getting the right answer? But at the level of physics, it doesn't really make sense to do this. So just keep that in mind, especially if you watch some of the other videos on the subject. All right, just to make sure we got this. Now the paper goes into a lot of detail here of deriving the equations. Let's look at a few more examples here. Okay. Let's look at this one. What happens if we shift one of the meters off to the side here? So this is the main loop here. The same value resistors, same solenoid. Still one milliamp circulating. Now in this case, both of these loops here do not go around the solenoid, so both of these loops have no induced voltage, and therefore Kirchhoff's law holds. All right, so in both of these, the sum going all the way around must be zero. So both of these meters would show 0.9 volts. Now, if you think you got this, see if you can figure out what would happen in these circuits. What if we had four meters like this? What would these four voltmeters show? There's multiple ways to go around the solenoid in this case, and there's multiple loops that do not go around the solenoid. And what about this one? If we just swap the position here of the right-hand voltmeter and resistor, does that make a difference? Take a look. Let me know what you think in the comments. So there we have it. We've shown that it's possible in the same circuit for two voltmeters connected to the same point to be to show different readings. And we've explained why, and we actually explained it using Kirchhoff's law. So there's a whole bunch of videos out there of people running experiments, trying to figure this out. I actually don't have an experiment in hand. I've been consumed with trying to figure this out myself and trying to get it to a point where I could explain it to someone else. So I haven't actually wired up the experiment yet. I wanted to fully understand the theory and have a solid prediction in hand before I carried on with the experiment. But if you want to, you could get lost in a rabbit hole of videos of people looking at this and uh, trying to figure out what's going on. This land will be gone. Today's reading recommendation is Div, Grad, Curl, and all that, an informal text on vector calculus. This is literally the book from which I learned everything I know about vector calculus. Um, maybe that's a good thing, maybe not. But this goes into great detail. If you've ever seen those diagrams that show an electric field and all the, all the lines of flux radiating out from it are two electric fields and then the lines bowing over between them or the lines of a magnetic bar magnet when you put it under iron filings. If you want to be able to calculate those types of diagrams from first principles, that's in the first couple pages of this book. So it does talk about div, grad, and curl, and all that. Um, excellent resource. If you're into vector calculus just for fun, go get it. Oh, and I will add, the Amazon price for this, as I'm recording this, is a ridiculous $44.95 for the paperback in new condition. So if you check this out, definitely dig into the used copies. The used copy should be totally fine. Even if it's not the latest edition, use the, you should be great. Save yourself some money. And uh, don't be like a Tesla and waste your money.